Hi, it's Mr. Anderson and this is Chemistry Essentials video 31. It's on redox reactions. And the word redox is a combination of both reduction and oxidation. And so these are reactions where we're actually transferring high energy electrons to more low energy electrons. And so that's providing us with energy. And so when you're burning gasoline, that is a redox reaction. Likewise, inside our body, cellular respiration, when we break down our food and get energy from it, is also a redox reaction. And so the first thing you should understand that in a redox reaction we have two parts to it. We've got reduction and oxidation. Now the oxidation portion is going to be the losing of high energy electrons and the reduction is going to be the gaining of those electrons. But when you're looking at a chemical equation we don't put electrons in the equation so oftentimes it's hard to figure out where these electrons are actually going. And so we use something called oxidation numbers to figure out where the electrons are going. We can then break it down into what are called half reactions that show the electrons and then we can finally combine that back into a balanced chemical equation. Now these are important in the chemistry lab because we can use them as a different type of titration. We call that a redox titration. And again, these are really important because they allow us to produce energy. Not only the energy that drives your car, but the energy that drives you. And so in a redox reaction, we're moving high energy electrons from the oxidized substance to the reduced substance. And it's really uh, common to get these two terms messed up. And so the mnemonic that I use is called oil rig. And what does that mean? Well, the O in oil rig stands for oxidation, and oxidation is losing electrons. So what is reduction? The R stands for reduction is gaining electrons. And so just like you maybe learned SOCATOA in your geometry class, you should learn oil rig in your chemistry class. It's a good way to remember where the electrons are flowing. And so let me give you a real simple example of a redox reaction. Let's say we have hydrogen gas and fluorine gas, and they combine together to create hydrogen fluoride. That would be a redox reaction. And so did you see what was being oxidized? So where were the electrons being lost from? It was from the hydrogen. And so we would say in this redox reaction of hydrogen plus fluorine to make hydrogen fluoride, the hydrogen is being oxidized and the fluorine is being reduced. It's gaining these high energy electrons. And so we could write this out as half reactions. In other words, we've got the hydrogen making hydrogen ions plus these electrons that it is losing. And then we have the fluorine which is gaining those electrons. And so this would be the oxidation portion of the redox and this should be the reduction portion of that. But you should have been watching carefully. How did I decide that the hydrogen was losing the electrons and the fluorine was gaining the electrons? And so how would you figure that out? Well, we use something called oxidation numbers to figure out where they're going. And there's some simple rules that allow you to type, or excuse me, allow you to figure out the oxidation numbers. One thing you should know is that when writing the charge, let's say uh, a charge of uh, a negative two charge, a charge generally we write the number first, two, and then we would write the minus. But when you're writing oxidation numbers, you're gonna write either the plus or the minus before the number. And so the first rule is really, really simple. If we ever have elements that are free or free elements, the oxidation number is always going to be zero. So if we have hydrogen gas by itself, what's gonna be our oxidation number? It's simply gonna be zero. Let's say we have magnesium solid. What's gonna be the oxidation number of the magnesium? It's going to be zero. Let's say we have sulfur, remember, which will form into these big eight uh, atom molecules. What's gonna be the oxidation number? Again, it's going to be zero. So rule number is really simple. If they're by themselves, it's always gonna be zero. If we've got ions, then it's going to match the charge. And so if we're looking at sodium chloride, you can see this is an aqueous solution. What's going to be the charge? Well, the sodium is an alkali metal, so it's gonna have a plus one charge. And the chlorine is a halogen, so it's going to be a minus one charge. And so those are going to match. One thing you'll start to notice is that these are going to add up to zero. Let's say we're looking at potassium. What's going to be the charge? It's going to be plus one. Let's say we would look at magnesium chloride. Well, the chlorine is going to have a minus one charge. And since we have two of those, what's my magnesium charge going to be? It's going to be a plus two. All right, let's move to the next one. These deal with oxygen and hydrogen. Oxygen is always going to be a negative two oxidation state unless it's in a peroxide and it'd be a negative one. And hydrogen is always going to be a plus one charge if it's bonded with a nonmetal and it's going to be a minus charge if it's bonded with a metal. Um, last thing that I, me I mentioned this just a second ago is that in a neutral compound, all of them are going to sum up to zero. 
But if it was an ion, they'd sum up to the charge of the ion. So let's start applying that. If we look at water right here, what's going to be the charge of the hydrogen? It's going to be plus one. And we can see that in a couple of ways. Number one, since it's bonded to a nonmetal, it's going to be plus one. What's going to be the charge of the oxygen? It's going to be minus two. And since we have two of these, they're going to sum up to zero. Let's look at this next one. How do we work through this? Well, if we look at the sodium, it's going to be a plus one charge. Again, that's going to be in the first column of the periodic table. Where could we go next? Let's look at the oxygen. The oxygen, remember, is always going to be a negative two. So we could write that in as a negative two. Okay, so what's our charge at this point? We got two of these sodium, so we're at plus two on this uh, left side. Our oxygen, since it's minus two and we have three of those, it's going to be six minus or, or minus six on the right side. So what is the sulfur going to be? It has to be plus four because we're going to sum up to zero. Let's look at this ion over here. And this ion here, let's just label what the oxygen is going to be. The oxygen is going to be minus two. We know that oxygen is always minus two. And so what's going to be the sulfur in this case? Well, since this is minus two and we have four of them, that would be minus eight. Since the ion has a charge of 2 minus, we know that the sulfur has to be plus 6. And so you can see that the sulfur is actually going to change depending on what compound it's in. So do you think you have those rules? I know it seems complex, but it's really powerful when we're looking at redox reactions. So let's look at a redox reaction. Let's say we take some magnesium solid and we just put it in hydrochloric acid. What's going to happen? Well, you're going to start to see bubbles show up. And so those bubbles are going to be hydrogen gas. And this is a redox reaction. And so we're producing hydrogen gas on the right side of the equation. And so what we can do is we can go through this reaction and we can start writing down the oxidation numbers. And so let's start with the magnesium. Magnesium is all by itself, so what's its charge going to be? It's going to be zero. Now if we look at the hydrochloric acid, we could start with the chlorine ion since it's an aqueous solution. And so that's going to be a minus one. What's our hydrogen going to be? It's going to be a plus one. So now we've got our oxidation states here. Let's go over to magnesium chloride. So this is also, also an aqueous solution. So we could start with the chloride. That's going to be minus 1. Since we have two of those, what's our magnesium going to be? It has to be plus 2. Now let's go over to hydrogen on this side. Hydrogen on this side is simply going to be 0 because it's all by itself. Okay, so now what we can see is if we look through chlorine, for example, on the left side is minus 1. On the right side is minus 1. And so that's neither going to be oxidized or reduced. But if we look at magnesium here, it has an oxidation state of zero on the left side. What is it on the right side? Plus two. So since it's gotten more positive, it's lost two electrons. And so if you're losing electrons, what is that? That is simply oxidation. So magnesium is being oxidized. In other words, it's losing two electrons. Where did those electrons go? Well, let's look at hydrogen. It's plus one on the left side, and it's zero on the right side. And so since it's gone down in value, that means that it's gained electrons. But you might say, well, it's, only it's gained one electron. But again, you could look at a, the coefficient out here. Since there's two of these, we've actually gained two electrons. And so that would be the reduction portion of this uh, equation. So now we could write the half equations for this redox reaction. The first one's going to be the oxidation. We have magnesium as a solid, and it's losing those two electrons. And then if we look at the hydrogen, the, the reduction portion is going to be this. The hydrochloric acid is being reduced. In other words, it's gaining those electrons that are lost from the magnesium itself. And so let me give you a practice problem. Right here we've got manganese plus lead nitrate is going to make man manganese nitrate plus lead solid. And so what you should do is write out the equation, figure out the oxidation numbers of all the atoms in this equation, then figure out what is being oxidized and what is being reduced, and then try to write out those half reactions. And if you think you have it right, you could try to post some of your answers in the comments down below. And so what are some applications of this? The first one would be titrations. Remember, titrations are always used in stoichiometry. We're trying to figure the amount of an unknown. And so a great example of a redox titration would be the Winkler method. And the Winkler method is used to figure out how much oxygen is in water. And in biology, that's really important. The amount of oxygen in water tells us what, how healthy the water is. In other words, what organisms can live in the water, how much of that oxygen is dissolved and they can actually use. And so what you can do is a series of reactions. So a series of reactions where we're converting that oxygen into a precipitate, manganese hydroxide. We then convert it into iodine. And then we can use thiosulfate to actually 
do a titration. And what we're doing is we're reducing the iodine. And so remember, in a typical acid-base titration, what we're doing is changing the pH. Here, what we're doing is changing or doing a redox reaction when we're actually transferring electrons. And we use starch in this as well. And when we get a change in those electrons, what we get is a color change. And so we can figure out the amount of the iodine, and then we can work backwards to figure out the amount of oxygen. What would not be another application of redox? Remember, it's in energy production. And so this big molecule right here is going to be a triglyceride. That's a fat. That's going to be the fat that you find in your food. It has a high amount of energy because there's going to be energy in the electrons of the hydrogen around the carbon. But if we were to look at something like this, this is isooctane that's going to be found in gasoline. It also has a high amount of energy, and that energy is going to be found in the hydrogen atoms that are around the carbon. And so what happens in a redox reaction is we can actually transfer those electrons to oxygen and we can release energy in that transfer. And so did you learn the following? Could you identify what's the oxidized substance and what's the reduced substance? Remember, the oxidized substance is the one that's losing the electrons and the reduced substance is gaining it. And then finally, do you have some kind of an application? A great example would be a titration like the Winkler method we said in determining the amount of oxygen. That's redox reactions and I hope that was helpful.